Hey, what's up? Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Roll Pod, an Alabama sports podcast from Bama 247. I'm Cody Goodwin, staff writer with 247 Sports, and joining me today, fellow staff writer at Bama 247, Mike Rodak. Mike, are you ready for a lecture? I am. Is it about nothing? (laughs) How do you feel about the importance of nothing? (laughs) That was, uh, you know, it's been a while since Nick Saban's come off a Wednesday practice and has really started to give a lecture like it that used to be happened more often i would say but it tends to happen games like this you know like the non-conference or lower level sec teams or the F- fcs game <clears throat> and then it, it's always like you know why is the team not trying as hard this week and that you could read between the lines and save what he was saying wednesday night and, and kind of pick that up that he wasn't totally thrilled with whether it was just their effort Wednesday's practice or the entire week talks about the importance of nothing. You can have all the talent in the world, but if you don't try hard, then what are you? Nothing was his point. And uh, you know, that was clearly something that he had just told the players. And uh, as he often says, he uses his press conference, the media, if you will, to send the message too. So um, not only that, but also when he was asked about the solar eclipse on Saturday, and didn't really answer the question. Um, obviously, it's more of a fun sort of question. Like, I don't think they're necessarily going to be distracted by the solar eclipse. It's not a, a full one. Um, but he basically said, you know, I should text them what to do. <laughs> he said, if, if, you know, maybe if they're not doing the right thing on the field, I should text them. And that was just a continuation of his frustration with the team. Um, you could always tell uh, when he starts talking that way. Um, that clearly they weren't doing something right in the field. And he's just saying, well, maybe I should just text them uh, and that will get through to them. So you can pick up on those things. And I, honestly, I don't think that's happened on a Wednesday night, probably since like Mercer in 2021, uh, when he really came out firing about you know how the team was was practicing that week. So I don't know if this was that bad, but it was noticeable. Yeah, no. For those who who don't know, Wednesday night after practice, we we meet with Nick Saban for 15 minutes or so, and he led off last night. We're recording this on a Thursday morning. Um, he led it off with uh, "Y'all ready for a lecture?" and gave us the the spiel on the importance of nothing. And Mike, you've sat through hundreds more Nick Saban press conferences than I have. When he comes in, not hot, but like he was clearly frustrated. Like mm-hmm. what, like, what are you, do you, do you like buckle up and enjoy the ride? Do you kind of smirk? Like I, when he said that, I was like, you could probably hear it on the video that we post on our YouTube. I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm ready for this. Like what you got, man. Get your fingers ready. You start getting ready to type because you can tell <laughs> that he's about to say something. Um, that's really all you can do is just figure out how to relay the message and, um, how you're going to write it and what he's going to say. So yeah, again, that was one where it's not necessarily explicit. Like he's not saying that he wasn't happy with the team, but he was saying he wasn't happy with the team. I mean, that's, that's the Nick Saban language uh, that he speaks. Yeah. We only got Saban for about eight minutes last night. Um, You know, and, and Josh um, Max and SID at Alabama, he, he had made the, you know, right before the last question was asked, he's like, unless we have any follow-ups, this is the last one. And I had half an idea to raise my hand and I wanted to walk right into the snake pit and be like, coach, what prompted the, the lecture tonight? Like what, what happened at practice? Right. Just to, just to see what he would say, probably wouldn't reveal any details, but like you mentioned, you can kind of pick up on the hints here and there about, you know, texting the players, this and that, the importance of nothing. And, you know, like it, it rained a little bit last night. So I'm pretty sure that forced him inside. So maybe just not, not a great midday midweek practice for for Alabama it seemed like yeah in fact that just reminded me when Saban went on the rant before the the Mercer game in 2021 Michael Casagrande picked up on it and uh he asked basically the question that you know what are you uh you know what happened basically to prompt this and and then Saban started railing about external factors and it was hot outside and players don't want to play and they don't think the opponent's very good and the media was writing about how great they are um so yeah a dirty uh, rat poison rat <laughs> I, yeah I, you might have even used that word um <clears throat> so and that's kind of where this team like it doesn't surprise me that that's kind of where this team's at um because it is a week where you're probably this is probably their easiest sec game um 
in terms of the level of the opponent and the way Arkansas is playing. It's at home. Um, you know, they just won three games. I think they're they're feeling good about their um, chances, about their abilities. And this is kind of the classic time when Saban likes to knock them down a little bit. And I think he even said, too, I forget where it was um, this week, but basically said, um, you know, if you're trying to bench press 300 pounds and you started at 200 and now you're at 250, you still need to keep working to get to 300. Like you can't um, just kind of be happy that you're at 250. And that's, I think, kind of explains where he thinks this team is, that they've made progress, but obviously there's still a long ways to go. 100%. We are at the halfway point of the 2023 season. Got a fun show for you guys today. At that halfway point, Alabama's 5-1 and one overall, 3-0 and oh against the SEC, all alone at the top of the SEC West. They control their own destiny to Atlanta for the conference championship game. Like uh, Mike alluded to, this season is very far from over, but I think if you told folks after the Texas loss and even after the miserable performance against South Florida, Crimson Tide uh, would be sitting pretty. Um, one might even argue that they've been improving the last few weeks midway through the season. I think they would probably take it. Um, but what we're going to do on today's show, we're going to play a game buy or sell because we've reached the midway point. Um, I scoured the internet this week for various opinions on Alabama football, um, on the team as a whole, on players, on the staff, maybe a little bit more. Um, I'm going to then pose those opinions to Mike. I let him know that this is the game we're playing. I did not let him know what exactly I went and found. Um, and we're going to play buy or sell on a few of those opinions. So thinking this should park some fun discussion since nobody knows the team better than us, right? Um, so <laughs> yeah. pardon, in, pardon the interruption voice there, the voiceover. So first up, um, this is actually, this, this tells you how wide I cast the net uh, from <clears throat> Spencer Hall, better known as every day should be Saturday um, on his latest top, whatever he ranked Alabama's 26 to 20 win over Texas A&M at number 10. And he wrote, quote, would be higher, but gets less credit for beating a team managed by Jimbo Fisher, who'd buy insurance on every hand of blackjack, whether they asked him to or not. Um, Fisher punted on fourth and one at the Alabama 45. Alabama scored on the ensuing possession and a and trailed from there to the end. But here's the buy or sell prompt. Please do not tell anybody this. Alabama's quietly building Jalen Milrow into a not a stoppage starter, but an actual good quarterback with a go-to receiver in Jermaine Burton. Nine catches, 197 yards, and two touchdowns last Saturday. Lurking, this team is some. It's portraying some sneaky, serious-type lurking here. Mike, do you think this Alabama team is lurking in terms of the national conversation as it pertains to the top of the SEC and even the college football playoff? Top of the SEC, yes. College football playoff, maybe. Is this a national championship team that's lurking in the weeds? I would still need to be convinced on that. Um, I think this would be the most impressive coaching job for Nick Saban if he was able to get this team to a national championship and, you know, never mind even win it. And we said that a couple of years ago, like that 2021 team, that was kind of the, the, the story that that was a great coaching job by Nick Saban with a young team and a first year quarterback and Kirby smart called it Nick Saban's best coaching job, but this would be to a greater degree um, because I, the passing game, like I, I think it certainly made strides against a and Like that was clearly the best we've seen it. That was probably the best we've seen Jalen Milrow. Um, Burton was certainly the go-to receiver in that game. Um, is he still a stopgap sort of starter? I would still say yes. Like I'm not sure if he's even the starter next year, even if he's here. Um, like I still think there's – there's questions there. Um, I still like Jermaine Burton could come out in this game and have three catches for 32 yards. And like, it's just kind of the way that's gone at that position this year. Um, so I don't know if he's necessarily the go-to star number one wide receiver like they've had. Um, but again, it looks better than it looked. Um, well, I was going to say to start the year, but keep in mind, Middle Tennessee, they came out firing too. Like Milrow had a great game there and receivers had a great game. So I, it, it doesn't look like it used to look. Like I, I still think there's a gap between what it looked like with Bryce and Jamison Williams and, and some of the guys before. But it looks better than I think we thought it would. Um, so it's somewhere in the middle. I don't know if I'm buying. I don't know if I'm selling. 
I'm buying them certainly being capable of winning the SEC West and going to the SEC championship game and maybe beating Georgia and getting into the playoff. But I'm not sure I'm buying them as a national championship team quite yet. Yeah, I think I'm buying them lurking, um, you know, because I think I think the second half of the season is really going to dictate. I mean, obviously, the a lot of the college football playoff conversation. Right. I think we we got a pretty important note from Red River last week where Oklahoma came back and, you know, beat Texas. Um, tremendous game. I think that the SEC is starting to sort itself out, um, you know, both in the West and then George obviously looked really, really good against Kentucky. The Pac-12 is going to sort itself out for the most part over the next few weeks, right? You got what Oregon, Washington this weekend. That's the first of, you know, Oregon's going to have to play Washington. USC is going to have to play both of those teams. And then there's obviously going to be a conference championship game. Same thing in the Big 12. So we could see Red River again. Um, you know, I don't know that Michigan plays anybody in the Big Ten until the end of the season when they hit, you know, Penn State and, and Ohio State. Um, but we're presuming whoever wins out of that three team tango um, is ultimately going to go for it. And then Florida State has the inside track to win the ACC. So it's just a lot of different moving parts. What does it mean from a national championship picture? I don't know. But as long as Alabama continues to take care of its own business, I feel like you know, the rest of it will kind of sort itself out and maybe they'll position themselves for, you know, a spot in the playoff, you know, or at least they'll position themselves to one, get to Atlanta and two, if they're able to maybe win that game, that could, you know, catapult them into the playoff. So I'm buying lurking, but I agree with you. I'm not sure that we know yet if this team can do the job. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's probably true every year. I don't know if any of what happens in the other conferences ultimately will matter unless there's complete chaos because, if Alabama wins the rest of their regular season games, six of them, and they go to Atlanta and they beat Georgia, then they're in the playoff. If they win the rest of their six games, go to Atlanta, lose to Georgia, they're a two-loss team. Again, I think it would take complete chaos everywhere else for them to be in the playoff. Uh, and if they lose, I mean, I guess this is the one scenario. If they lose a game, Tennessee, LSU, Auburn, and they still win the West, and they go and they beat Georgia to win the SEC, and they're a two-loss SEC champion, that's tough because that almost happened a couple of years ago. They almost lost to Auburn in overtime, and they still would have gone to Atlanta, and you know they beat Georgia the next week, and there was a lot of metrics that said they still would have gotten into the playoff. But I, I still think it, it comes down to can you beat Georgia or not, and which is pretty much what it's been every single year, or you know beating Florida as it was – a few years ago, but um, I, I, to get in with two losses, whether it's to Georgia or somebody else, is still going to be really tough. So, they yeah, to win seven more games and them beating Georgia, which Georgia's picking up some steam now that Kentucky win. I mean, they're the fifth best passing offense in the country. It's crazy to think, but that's what they are. And Carson Beck put up what 400 yards on Kentucky. And, um, yeah, as soon as that defense gets back to what it was if it could like it's a really hard team to beat um so that's still the roadblock like no matter what happens in the pac 12 big 10 acc like georgia's right in front of you and that's that's what's keeping you from the playoff yeah and i guess the to tie a bow on this particular topic the one thing that i also have in my mind is that you know alabama may run the table and finish what would that be 12 and 1 you know be georgia in the sec win the conference there's a world where, you know, now that we're halfway through, we can kind of see it a little bit where Oklahoma runs the table and beats Texas again. Um, you know, the winner of Oregon, Washington runs the table and wins the Pac-12. Um, whoever comes out of Penn State, Ohio State, Michigan wins the Big Ten. Florida State goes the distance in the ACC. So then you've got four undefeated Power Five champs. Right. And one loss, Alabama, who won the SEC, like. You know, like that's I like I don't want to put that energy out there because it's college football and. I don't know that it'll go that cleanly, but like that is a possibility now that we're halfway through the season to at least acknowledge like that's a thing that could happen. Yeah, no SEC team in the playoff would be wild, but that's that's completely fair scenario for an SEC team to be left out if you have four undefeated conference champions everywhere else, which I don't think that's happened in the history of the playoff. Uh, I mean, it would be – it certainly could happen this year. It would certainly be um, – unique uh i'm just going back and looking real quick i mean it's 
yeah, I mean, there's two undefeated teams last year. There was one the year before that, two the year before that, three the year before that, three, zero, one, one, one. So there's only been three, one or two years out of those the playoff years, and the rest there's been less than three undefeated teams. So to have four would be crazy, um, but it can happen. Like, I think there's teams that are capable of, of going to distance, um, and that would leave Alabama out. I, I completely would agree that 12 and one, they would be out. Yeah. Um, this would be a fantastic year for the first year of a 12 team playoff. Um, so yeah, that would be, that's interesting, interesting little dynamic there. Um, second buy or sell topic. Um, you kind of already hit on this a little bit and maybe, maybe you've got more to add, maybe not, but this is from uh, Ari Wasserman of the athletic. Ari wrote a column this week titled uh, the inevitability of Alabama and how far Nick Saban can take this team. And in that he wrote that Alabama should be heavy favorites to win the West, um, that they beat Texas A&M on the road despite playing poorly and that the door is open for some late season magic. If Jalen Milrow and company can figure it out on offense um, and that this team went from quote written off to very interesting near the end of his column. Ari wrote this specifically quote, Alabama is here to stay. It is in the national spotlight and it's a dangerous team that might feel like it's playing with house money. Now, depending on how far Saban takes this team, this could wind up being one of his best coaching jobs End quote, are you buying or selling? It sounds like you're already buying, but I'm curious if you have more thoughts on this. I'm buying the, it would be their his best coaching job if they want the distance i'm not sure i'm buying everything that he's saying there i i don't know if they're heavy favorites to win the sec west i think they're certainly the favorite but things can flip really quickly if they lose to lsu just like what happened last year so i mean that game still works um and again you lose to tennessee or kentucky that's going to hurt you in the sec west standings it's going to let a and m back in I don't want to say you can completely write off Ole Miss at this point, but they still have to play Georgia, and they already essentially have a two-game deficit to Alabama because of the the head-to-head loss and the tiebreaker. So I don't know if Ole Miss is really a factor, but LSU and and A and M is still a factor. If A and M, and let me look at their remaining schedule here, but um, you know, you're talking like, let's see, and and they still, still have to play LSU, LSU. Yeah. right? Ole Miss and, and you know, they still have Tennessee this week at Tennessee, at Ole Miss, at LSU. So Woof. that's tough. Um, so maybe it comes down to LSU, but that's that's still a tough game for Alabama. I, I still think this is an Alabama team that is very much capable of losing one to two more uh, games, one to two more SEC games. So that's what makes it fun. You know, it's, it's a different team to watch. I think even Nick Saban said it to ESPN, like this is a different team. I think it's kind of a soft way of saying like this team's not quite as good as the other teams. Um, so, you know, they've certainly stabilized. Like, yeah, people wrote them off after the first three games. Um, it, I, I don't know if that was completely fair, um, but I don't know if it's completely fair to like say that they're, you know, riding in on a white horse and um, they're inevitable and they're going to be there at the end. Like, they're still. 12 to 15 pretty good teams in college football. And I don't think Alabama is inaccurately placed at <clears throat> number 11 right now um, in the AP poll. So that's still, there's some ground to make up there. And, uh, you know, again, it's fun. Well, to see what happens, I really don't know either way. Yeah. I think, you know, <coughs> you, you, me and Talty were kind of briefly talking about it earlier this week, but you look at the remaining schedule for Alabama and not to, not to shrug off Arkansas and Chattanooga, but you know, you look at the remaining games, like where could they lose? Like Tennessee, um, you know, I personally don't trust Joe Milton, but Josh Heupel still call in plays. So, you know, they're going to be dangerous. LSU looks like they might have, you know, player for player, the best offense in the sec, but they may also player for player, um, have the worst defense just because they don't know how to, I mean, they got good players on the defense. They just don't know how to use them just through a wet paper bag. Um, Kentucky looks like um, a four-star version of Georgia because Georgia just has a billion five stars and Kentucky is kind of made in the same mold just with a bunch of four and three stars. Um, and then Auburn might be a mess, but that game's at Auburn and you just never know what's going to happen. So it's, you know, you can see the landmines, but it's also like, you know, Maybe I just I believe in Alabama's defense so much that it's like none of those scare me to the point of keeping me up at night. I guess if I'm an Alabama fan, I don't know. Um, but I agree with you that like you know if they you know 
there are reasons to worry, I guess, a little bit about what they have left. But I don't know. Maybe I'm just uber confident in the defense, and I I think they'll get the job done. And then it's a matter of can you put four quarters together in Atlanta if you get that far. Yeah, I mean the defense. A and M again. I A and M's a backup quarterback. <clears throat> I think he was not. They have great receivers. Um, with you know Evan Stewart and I Smith, and you know they showed a little bit, but Max Johnson was not the right quarterback to attack Alabama through the air with the receivers that they had. Their offensive line was clearly not good enough to protect Max Johnson to let him do that. And you know overall, this is a A and M offense that ranks 49th in the country. So, I mean, you look at LSU is third in the country. Georgia is eighth in the country in offense. And Tennessee is lurking down there at 22nd. Um, So there's three offenses in the top 22 that you still have to play, assuming you play Georgia. And Texas is the 13th best offense in the country. And they did some things to you. So... I mean, I think the most impressive game that they've had was doing what they did to Ole Miss, which Ole Miss is still sitting 12th in the country in offense. I think we expected to see what we saw in Mississippi State. And even Nick Saban was a little bit peeved about the defense in Mississippi State and giving up some of the runs they did. And I think we kind of expected them to do what they did to A&M with the backup quarterback. And the best thing that they did at A&M was early in the game that really was maybe forgotten about, but those first two drives when AM got into the red zone, stopped them on fourth down and then held them to a field goal. So, I mean, that could have been 14 points right there. Instead it was three, which made a big difference in the game. And then you get late in the game. And the best thing that they did late in the game was the, um, the safety where AM gets the ball down a touchdown as I wrote about, it's basically the same scenario two years ago, Zach Calzada, and he led them down for a touchdown in this case, they drove him backwards, got the two points, made it a two-possession game, and that changed the, the last five minutes. It changed a and strategy at the goal line the next time they got down there. Um, so, I mean, those were important moments, but, you know, can you do the same thing against LSU? Can you do the same thing against Georgia? Can you do the same thing against Tennessee? Like, I just we'll wait and see. Maybe they will. Maybe they won't. 100%. Going to get into a little bit of draft talk here as we continue this buy or sell game that we're playing. Um, <clears throat> kind of an easy way to talk about some of the standout individuals. And I believe now that I'm looking at this, all the individuals um, that I brought up um, here at least are on the defensive side of the ball, which makes sense because that's where it seems like all the consistent superstars are. Um, ESPN's Mel Kiper Jr. wrote this week that he uh, plans to pay a lot closer attention to Chris Braswell over the remainder of the season. He wrote... Quote, Braswell, five-star recruit in the 2020 class, has seized his opportunity this season, four and a half sacks, nine tackles for loss. That's more sacks than he had in his career coming into the season, um, only seven and a half. Um, can Braswell keep this up? We know NFL teams are always looking for pass rushers, and I've heard the six foot three, 255 pounder is going to test extremely well at the Combine. With what he has put on tape in the first six games, he has a chance to rise further than his second ground grade. That's from Mel Kuyper. Mike, are you buying or selling that Chris Braswell could potentially be an early second, late first round draft pick? Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, I think right now he's, you know, solid day two, you know, second or third round. Um, I think if I'm an NFL team, I'm wondering where I play him, especially if I'm in a four, three, uh, at six foot three, like I would be a little bit concerned with his height and his length um, to be a, like a defensive end in a four, three in the NFL, um, in which there are similar concerns with Will Anderson, um, you know, coming out this year, like, can he be what he is if he's not a physical freak like Miles Garrett or, or some of those guys. So um, it's just a matter of where you put him. Like, I think it, in a three, four in the NFL, like that's where you want him. Uh, but we've seen, again, some tweeners come out of Alabama. Anthony Jennings is another one that never really found a position um, in the NFL with the Patriots. And they tried him inside. They tried him outside. I don't know if he's a defensive end in the NFL. So you have these guys that kind of like perfectly fit the Alabama 3-4 outside linebacker mold. And I think Braswell certainly does. But that doesn't always translate to what NFL teams want at that position. Um, so that's – I think it's going to be a team-by-team evaluation. I 
agree with Kuiper. Like he's going to test really well. You know, his um, he was what made the the freaks list from um, the athletics. Uh, Bruce Feldman in the last two years for you know uh, squatting seven hundred pounds, I think it was, and um, power cleaning like three fifty four hundred pounds, and you know runs the twenty one miles per hour. That's come up a bunch of times here. So he'll test well at the combine. Um, you know his film, I think, will be there this year. Um, but again, I think he probably falls into that category. I mean, Christopher Allen came out a couple years ago and played that position for Alabama. It was a third round pick for the Broncos. I think he's better than that. He's not Dallas Turner or Will Anderson, who are going to be top, or in Anderson's case, was a top 10 pick. I think Turner will be. So he's somewhere in between. So end of the first, early second, sounds good to me. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think the other thing, too, um, and we're seeing this with both, you know, Turner and Braswell and, um, that they they're being asked to do more than just rush the passer, right? Like obviously when you're an edge rusher, you you're responsible for setting the edge, right? And he's done a really good job playing the run. Alabama as a whole has done a pretty good job of playing the run. Um, you know, but he, you know, they, they, they ask, I guess they, Alabama asked, you know, Braswell and Turner to occasionally drop back and cover kind of that short intermediate area of the field. And both of those guys are athletic enough that they've been able to do that, right? Like we saw Braswell, Obviously, you know, the pick six against Mississippi State, um, you know, and I think the other thing, too, and, and Saban talks a lot about, you know, these players creating value for themselves. And, you know, we've kind of talked mostly about like Ja'Cory Brooks, like not a ton of at receiver, but he blocked a punt and, you know, maybe he's dealing with an injury. So maybe that plays into why we haven't seen a lot of them at all this year. But, you know, Braswell blocked a field goal. Like, I'm sure that there's somebody out there in the league who will take a flyer on him and stick him on special teams just so he soaks up some of those reps, um, you know, first year or two to get used to the NFL game speed. But, no, I think it's a fair point that, like, fit, you know, where, like, where, right? Like, it's got to be the right franchise that's going to be dedicated to playing the type of defense where he can just go be the edge defender. Um, you know, that's that's more or less how he's going to hack it in the NFL. But um, he's been really fun to watch this year. And, yeah. you know, we, we wrote about him in fall camp. You wrote about him this week. Um, you know, just a guy that, you know, really buying into, you know, just one good year, right? Like the idea that if you play on Alabama's defense and you ball out for one year, it can change your life. And this is a guy that's really waited his turn patiently, right? Behind Will Anderson, then behind Dallas Turner and, you know, Drew Sanders even for a time. And and now here he is making the most of his opportunity. And, you know, he's playing a huge role on Alabama's, you know, I, I would argue it's a pretty elite defense. Yeah. Um, and I remember writing last year too, Will Anderson is really the first, first round pick at outside linebacker since Saban's been at Alabama. That was the last position that they needed. That's crazy to think about. First round pick at. <laughs> um, he was the first one. And uh, it, again, I think it, it speaks to that sort of <clears throat> transition evaluation of how, where they fit. I mean, they've had a lot of guys in those second and third rounds, Courtney Upshaw in the second round and um, you know, Terrell Lewis a few years ago was a third round pick of the Rams who kind of flamed out. So, it just depends on what the team runs in the NFL and how they see those guys fitting in. Um, but yeah, I, I think Braswell is a solid day two pick and there might be a team that falls in love with him enough to, to pick him late in the first. Uh, speaking of players that teams will fall in love with in the same NFL draft notebook, ESPN's Matt Miller highlighted Dallas Turner, um, second half of Alabama's pass rushing combo arguably the first half, just given what he's been able to do over the last few years. Uh, Miller included Turner in his draft risers from week six, which is crazy to think about, writing, quote, Turner has been dominant since take taking over the Will Anderson Jr. role in the Alabama defense. Six and a half sacks on his resume through six games, 33 pressures. No other pass rusher has shown the level of burst off the edge and ability to truly bend the corner this season. Turner, six foot four, 242 pounds, previously was competing with Florida State's Jared Verse and Penn State's Chop Robinson as the class's top edge rusher, but he's now in a tier of his own. I'm bumping him up to, into the top five overall in terms of draft prospects. Um, you buy and or sell in Dallas Turner as not only the number one defensive player, but perhaps even top five overall in this upcoming draft class. Yeah, I'll buy it because I do think teams have shown that they, if you have a really elite guy at pass rusher, um, which you know he certainly is, then they'll spend spend you know a draft pick pretty high on him. And that's a premium position in the NFL. I would say with quarterback, you know, number one corner, edge rusher, offensive tackle, 
maybe wide receiver has kind of become that. Like there's four or five positions in the NFL where a team will spend a, for, a top five pick on or even a top 10 pick on. And um, that's that's one of them. And if there's a team that's looking for, you know, the Texans were last year with Will Anderson, then can absolutely see it. Um, yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> I haven't followed the other guys in the class um, at edge rusher enough to make the head-to-head comparison there. But, I mean, he's been really good for Alabama. That was kind of the expectation. And he's gotten better since, you know, the time that he stepped foot on the field, you know, to replace uh, Drew Sanders a couple years ago. Yeah, no, he's been he's been really fun to watch. Didn't really do a whole lot of anything against Middle Tennessee in week one. Didn't really have to. Um, Texas kind of mitigated both him and Braswell with quick passes and double teams and screens. And, um, you know, Sark just really out of his mind when it came to play calling that game. But since then, I mean, Turner and Braswell both, um, but especially Turner, like his 33 pressures are the most in the country. Um, you know, six and a half sacks like that puts him on pace for what's that 13 sacks through 12 games, you know, and they may potentially play, you know, two, maybe even three more, depending on how this season ultimately unfolds. Like he is, you know, he's not Will Anderson. That's not fair, but he has been insanely productive and him and Braswell together. Um, you know, I want to say that they finished last year, those two alone, um, you know, behind Will Anderson, right? So he's taken up a lot of those snaps, but Turner and Braswell last year, I want to say finished with 60 or 70 total pressures over the course of a 13 game season. They're about at that mark at the halfway point this season, which tells you just one, how productive they are. And two, like, you know, if it doesn't feel like the pass rush is missing a beat after losing an all world pass rusher and Will Anderson, like. It's true. Like they, they really haven't missed a beat when you look at some of these numbers and, and just the way the, their production overall. Yeah. And it's something too. I don't have the exact number in front of me, but it does feel to my eye like they're playing more of the three, three nickel where they're having a third big body, you know, along the defensive line in there, you know, for run support mostly, um, which is really leaving only Turner and Braswell on the field. One of them at this, not at the same time, but most of the time, one of them is on the field. Um, so that's a little bit different. Like it felt like last year we saw more of Anderson and Turner out there at the same time, kind of that two, four nickel. Um, and sometimes you could say, and there was the argument made, and I think Dallas Turner even addressed it in the off season that like a lot of teams would double Will Anderson and try to stop him. And maybe that opened up opportunities for Dallas Turner. And he didn't think that was fair because he said he got doubled a lot too. Um, but now it's like, well, you only have one of them out there. And so defenses really can key on Turner or they can key on Braswell, which one ever runs out there. And even with that, they're still been really productive. So, um, that's something that I've noticed too, where I don't have to count how many plays, you know, they've both been out there at the same time, but it feels like it's less than what we saw with Turner and Anderson last year. Yeah, and I think the the pass rush overall has gotten, you know, a lot of assist from the guys on the actual defensive line, right? Like Justin mm-hmm. Aboigby, who, spoiler alert, that's our next buy or sell comment. Um, we'll get to that here in just a sec, but like he's been fantastic. Um, Tim Keenan, um, self, shameless selfless plug here. Go go check out Bama247.com. I wrote about Tim Keenan today. Um, just his emergence in the middle of the defensive line. Like he, you know, it's, it's, it's Turner and Braswell at the top of, you know, Alabama's pass rushing hierarchy. And then it's Tim Keenan with 14 pressures. That is the 19th most nationally for an interior defender and number two in the sec. Um, you know, plus you've got Jaheim Otis wrecking from literally any and every position along the defensive line, Tim Smith, who, you know, we projected as a starter in fall camp. He's the fourth guy in the rotation. And then you've got, you know, James Smith, Jamarian Latham, Damon Payne Jr., you know, all coming off the bench, giving really high level snaps. So it's, you know, this defense is really good at stopping a run, but they're also able to generate pressure from virtually everywhere on the defensive line. And I think that's really helped Braswell and Turner continue to just play at a high level all the way through the game. Um, you know, and really all the, you know, midway through the season, like there's just a lot of good things going on with the front seven for Alabama. Yeah, it's. I feel like it's deeper than last year. I mean, maybe they're not using their third outside linebacker as much as they used Braswell last year. Like, we haven't seen a ton of Quandarius Robinson, maybe early in the year. Um, but the defensive line feels deeper. Um, inside linebacker, you know, we've seen, you know, partly because of injuries, but, um, you know, Jihad Campbell as kind of the third guy in there, I think has done really well. And, um, it's, it's the strength of the team, I would say. Well, I mean, the secondary to some extent too, but, you know, the front seven, I think, has had a really good year um, so far. Yeah, no, they've been they've been fantastic. Um, speaking of fantastic, one more from this NFL draft notebook from ESPN. Jordan Reed 
wrote about Justin Aboigbe, another emerging star on Alabama's defensive line. Reed wrote, season-ended neck injury limited Aboigbe to only four games last season, but he has quickly returned to form this season. Six foot five, 292 pounds, fifth-year senior, has been an anchor for the Crimson Tide defense. He's known for his reliability as a run defender, but his pass rush ability has taken a significant leap. Two and a half sacks um, in four games entering the season. Um, he had a sack and a half against AM alone. He has proven to be a pretty standout pass rusher for Alabama. He wasn't really on draft radars because of the injury questions, but Aboigby has now entered the day three picture. Are you buying or selling Aboigby as a potential, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh round guy in the NFL draft? Definitely that. And I think you can make an argument for him to be like a third, fourth round pick too. I mean, I think teams looking for that three technique type and the boy B is six, five, what is he? Two ninety ish. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of that prototype three technique or sorry, five technique that two ninety two, where you kind of stick him in there. If you run a three, four, he's an end. If you, you know, run a four, three, you can probably put him at three technique. Um, and yeah, you know, I think he's really reliable against the run. You know, is he going to be a dominant, or productive pass rusher in the NFL, like he might do do it here and there. Um, but I think he's a really just solid player that is experienced and does the right thing and is in the right spot and doesn't get beaten too often. And um, that I think alone makes him a day three pick. And I think there's some things about his game, like Jordan was saying, if he doesn't prove that pass rush second half of the season, then um third, fourth round doesn't seem out of the question. They've had a lot of guys from this defensive line. That's kind of been the sweet spot. Like you, you know, Byron Young and Phil Mathis. And I mean, Raekwon Davis went in the second. Um, Christian Barmore had some more pass rushing, went in the second. So they've had a lot of guys just kind of come through and they're like automatic third, fourth round picks. And um, I feel like a boy B is, is moving into that category and, you know, it's, seven eight more games here left to prove it but i think he's certainly shown a lot over his first four and a half years here yeah two and a half sacks three and a half tackles for loss 26 total tackles 12 pressures um through six games this season like he is just he, he's been steady he's been reliable he's been productive and just again part of that defensive line rotation and depth that has really just opened up a lot of things for alabama defensively through the first six games and um, you know, that's the kind of production from that specific, you know, just area of the defense that they're going to need if they're going to want to go the distance. I know we were talking about that earlier, but, um, you know, I, I, I've said this on previous podcasts. I will probably say it on on more podcasts. But like when I say that, like a lot of the pieces are coming together, it's some of these little things, right? Like the production on the defensive line, production from the linebackers inside and outside, just the talent in the secondary. Um, you know, there's a lot, you know. There's really not a glaring weakness on this defense, and that's what you want six games in, but it's also what you're going to need if this team goes – the like if they're going to go the distance, they need this elite defense to play at elite level. Um, and so far through six weeks, I know I, outside of maybe the fourth quarter against Texas, they really have, and aboigby has been a really big part of that. And, you know, he, you highlighted him, you know, in in your story, just the, the defense pushing back A&M. Um, you know, when they had the opportunity to potentially go down and, and tie the game, um, you know, Aboigby was the the guy who recorded the sack on the safety. Like, and that came right after Keenan and Otis recorded the first sack to back them up to inside the 10. So there's just a lot of really good things going on with uh, Alabama's front seven on the defensive side. Yeah. And they, I mean, they're not Georgia in the sense that they're going to have like five or six guys in the front seven go in the first two rounds, whatever it's been the last couple of years. But you start thinking about like Aboigby, Tim Smith, Turner, Braswell, if Tresman Marshall comes out, he has one more year left, but you know, he's been around long enough where I think he probably will be like a late round pick. <clears throat> I mean, Deontay Lawson technically could come out after this year. Um, I don't know if he will, but that's four or five, maybe six guys out of that front seven. And then you add in Kool-Aid, um, Malachi Moore, I think are two automatic draft picks and Terry and Arnold is playing really well and he's eligible to go into the draft. That's potentially a third in the back end. Jalen key is in his last year, might be like a late round pick. Like that's four, like, man, you're talking like nine draft picks from this defense is not out of the question. Um, depending on, you know, Lawson's decision and Arnold's decision and we'll have to see, but I think at minimum we're talking five, six guys drafted from this defense this this uh, spring. 
Yeah. And if not this spring, then, you know, if Arnold comes back for a year, you know, he could bolster mm-hmm. himself into potentially first or second round conversation. Same thing with the Deontay Lawson. So, you know, Tresman Marshall could turn into a day two guy. Uh, Caleb Downs looks like he's going to be a no doubt day one guy when the time comes. Like there's, there's a lot. Of, <laughs> yeah. Right. Like there's, there's a lot of, you know, they could look back on this defense and just, you know, draft pick, draft pick day one, day one, day two, day two. Like it's just all over the place, um, which has been, it's been kind of fun to watch this season, but you know, I think we can look back and be like, yeah, there was, it was a crap ton of talent on this Alabama defense. Well, yeah. Downs is like Will Anderson. You kind of, you can already start like counting the games that he has left at Alabama. I think I did that as freshman year. You're like, this guy's not going to be here for four years. <laughs> like, that's Man, a, he made the, he made the pick back. against A&M and people started cracking jokes about like, you know, just get his dimensions ready for his gold jacket, you know, right. start, start carving the bus now. Um, yeah, which I don't know that I'm going to fully get on board with, but I'm also going to be, you know, like I'm, I'm going to keep that train within eyesight so that I can hop on it when the time comes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He'll be there. Um, I got two more years left. Of him. <laughs> Love me some Caleb downs. Um, back to a little bit bigger picture. Um, as we gear toward the end of this buy or sell game that we're playing CBS sports, Barrett, Sally, because we're really good company men, handed out mid-season grades for all the SEC teams, and he gave Alabama a B. Barrett wrote, The one lost Crimson Tide have dealt with issues, including an offensive line that has proven to be a liability. However, it has found a way to work through the issues up front, due in part to an offensive scheme that evolved toward the strengths of quarterback Jalen Milrow as the season has progressed. Make no mistake, this is far from the Alabama juggernaut that we have seen in the years past. However, it is one that can evolve into a championship caliber team if it keeps taking steps forward. We've kind of hinted at this throughout the show and even in previous shows are you buying or selling that this Alabama team could ultimately end up as a championship caliber team? Could they? Yeah. I mean, not, they're a top 15 team. I think any team in the top 15 right now <clears throat> could be there by the end of the year. Um, do I personally think that they will? Like I would still lean no. And there's things where I think they have gotten better. Like we've talked about the passing offense. There's also things that have not gotten better. Like the penalties have not gone away. Uh, the That's issues with that is, gotten worse um in some regards with the pre-snap penalties and at AM. Like you know, Milro, I think, has with the interceptions, that was, you know, that was the big issue with him against Texas. He still had the one against Ole Miss, and then he had the one where he stared down Amari Nye Black down the seam at AM and got jumped. Um, you know, the ability to see the field, know what the defense is doing, anticipate things have a good game situational awareness at the end with, you know, not kneeling it down. Like those are still things that can hurt Alabama, um, <clears throat> you know, in, in bigger situations. And so I don't know, you know, I think he's certainly gotten better, I think with accuracy and, um, you know, when those guys are open, just finding them and making those plays, which they needed to do at AM and and they did, but there's still some other things where I would still be kind of scared if that's the right word, that those might crop up at bad times. I think that's totally fair. Um, I'm of the belief that they, you know, the the pieces are there, I think, for them to do it. It's just a matter of putting the pieces in the proper place. And I think we've seen a lot that a lot of that more on the defensive side than we have on the offensive side. But I think there's there's a path for the offense to do that. And we've seen small bits and pieces, you know, like I mean, very obviously, like the offense is a better unit with another tight end on the field. Now, that takes a receiver off the field. But they just they they produce better. They tend to play better. They run the ball a little bit better when they have an extra big body on the field. Um, you know, I'd like to see them. You know, like when they throw the ball at Amari and I black, good things happen. Do that more. They just they don't always do that every single game. I know that's every game is game plan dependent, but like you know, you got a really good player there. Force feed them right. Like maybe not force feed them, but like just maybe try to find a way to include them in the game plan a little bit more. Um, the offensive line is a liability, but also um, this will be my last buy or sell spoiler. Um, so we'll get to it. But I think they have been playing better, at least in pass protection. Um, run blocking still very much an issue. And then you mentioned the penalties. Um, Milrose settled in, um, you know, and I, I wonder about this. Just, you know, Burton goes for, you know, nine catches, almost 200 yards, two touchdowns. And it's like they found a go to guy. I'm not buying that yet. Like I got to see it again. Like I got to see, you know, like him Burton and uh, Malik Benson kind of led the receiver room and snaps from that game. And it's like, 
Can we do that? Can we do that a little bit more consistency? Like, can we see those guys be the guys that get the 40 snaps a game and get the, you know, I think they combined for 20 targets. Like, can we see that on a regular basis? Then I'll believe that they've settled on their three, you know, big time receivers until then. Great game. But that's kind of all it was. I don't know. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Like, I, I do think like as much as Jalen Hale showed, was it the old Miss game? I've already started to lose track yeah. here. Yeah, it was the old Miss game. Um, and you know, you have Kobe Prentice, you have Kendrick Law. Like, I think you can probably start narrowing it down to Burton Bond Benson. And not not that Benson's done a whole lot either, but maybe you know, he's your third best guy there. And then Nye Black and Dupree and just kind of focus on those guys. But good things happen when Robbie Utes is in there blocking as your second tight end too. So maybe those are your top three. And it seems like Danny Lewis has really fallen off a tight end where early in the year he's getting more snaps. Now he's not. Um, but I think you can kind of tighten things up. Whereas at running back, I feel like he can almost go the opposite direction. I think there's reasonable, um, rational reasons to have – Jan Miller and Justice Haynes play a little bit more. Um, but, you know, will it ever happen? I don't know. I'd like to see a little bit more Justice Haynes, but I'm not sure that we're actually going to get it. Um, or at least it's starting to feel I'm... like Tyler Harrell from last year. <laughs> it was like every single week people were like, when are we going to see Tyler Harrell? And then we just never did. It was just the, the year ended and that was it. I'm like, all right, never saw him. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I don't know. I, I, at this point I'm done asking. And then when we see him, you know, that's when we'll be like, all right, what took so long, you know? Right. So we'll see what happens. Um, next buy or sell from the two, four, seven sports national desk, because we're really good company men. Our own Brad Crawford wrote this week that Alabama's Jalen Milrow is among the many quarterbacks around the country that deserves more credit. Uh, Brad wrote, since the Texas loss, Milrow has completed 75% of his throws for four touchdowns compared to two picks and won all three games as the starter. There's no question that Alabama is limited in the passing game, maybe a little bit with Milrow, but they are finding ways to push the ball downfield at times. And Milrow has thrown some strong passes, 321 yards against Texas A&M. He also scored two rushing touchdowns against Mississippi State. Mike, are you buying or selling that Milrow deserves more credit? Does yes. he deserve more credit? Well, I think so. I think in terms of like the the bright spots of the offense relative to preseason expectations. He might be the best one um, in terms of exceeding what we thought he would be able to do. <clears throat> Again, I think there's a limit to that. Um, I think there's still in, you know, the Chris Lowe ESPN article kind of hinted at it. Like Alabama is still probably going to be in the transfer portal looking for a quarterback this off season. Um, you still have Dylan Lonergan with a lot of promise that, depending on how things go here, maybe we'll see at the end of the year. Um, and then you still have Julian Sayan coming in. So I I don't know if Jalen Milrow is going to be the starter at Alabama next year. I don't know if he will be at Alabama next year at all. But in terms of what we thought he would provide Alabama, in terms of him being benched for the third game of the season, um, and now doing what he's doing, which I you know, dug up the stats from last year and Bryce Young through six games, only playing in five, was not as good statistically as what Jalen Milrow has done this year through six games, only playing in five. Um, and I think, you know, you can probably credit some of that to teams focusing more on stopping Bryce Young last year. Um, whereas I think this year the focus has been on stopping the run, but when those opportunities have been there, I think he's done a really good job. So if you can keep doing that and avoid, you know, you go into the red zone against Ole Miss and don't even see the guy who peeled off and throw the ball to him or you stare down the receiver at AM and he jumps the route or any of you know, the Texas interceptions. Like, if you can avoid those, then those have been his biggest problems. You know, the accuracy, for the most part, has not been his issue, which we thought it would be. Yeah. No, he's – I mean, he's he's done well. It's weird to say he's done well outside of the picks, but, like, some of that is just – it seems like fixable film room stuff, you know? Like, take take that extra beat to just kind of, you know, move your eyes and see if you know where the extra D DB is. Um, you know, I think that would have saved him against Ole Miss. I mean, especially against Texas. I mean, he probably would have, you know, given up a sack or thrown in a completion or whatever the case may be because they they, they just did a good job. I that, Those were just weird play calls, I guess, in addition to Texas doing a good job defensively. But against Ole Miss, like, you know – Instead of just looking straight for what I think that was Brooks, right? When he threw the red zone pick, like mm -hmm. 
drop your eyes, you know, half an inch and you see Burton's wide open on the underneath, like just take that. Right. Like same thing with, you know, against A&M, like there was a play where Burton was wide open. Um, and it, you know, it looked like for a split second, Dupree was wide open in the end zone. And it's almost looked like, it almost looked like Milrose saw them both and threw the ball between them and it went incomplete. And we're all just kind of like, right. you missed them. And too. it's like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. It's like it's both of them just really, just really, you know, and then he comes back and throws a dot to Burton in the back of the end zone for a touchdown. So it's like, you know, it's, I think Palti called it a roller coaster and that was just right. perfect description of that. But I'd like to see Alabama. And I know I've said this before, we saw it a little bit against Old Miss, um, saw it a little bit against Mississippi State, didn't really see it at all against AM because they've got linebackers fast enough to spy Milrow. And we saw that, I think, on like the first sack of the game. Um, lean into the run a little bit more, like get some design runs, give them some. I think I, I read this once like a, a pass run option where it's like, look, if your first two reads aren't there and you don't feel comfortable, go. Like that's just tuck it and go and just. You know, because it opens up the the it opens up the opposing defense a little bit more when you got a guy like Milra who can run the ball. Um, and I think that just that helps them, I think, long term, if they just lean into that a little bit more. And they've clearly had success when they've done that. And, you know, I'd like to see them do a little bit more of it moving forward, because um, I think they're going to need it to win these games. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there is a few plays there where especially when they went three or four wide Alabama and you kind of clear out the middle of the defense and then you're just. Yeah kind of looking and like, all right, there's a lane for Milrow. If the pass rush, you know, goes to the edge and you just go right up the middle, right between them. So, yeah, it wasn't a ton of um, sort of the, the legs of Milrow being used last week. And it changes every week. Like, and I, I think I said this the other day, like, I don't know if they're necessarily an offense that can like beat you all these different ways. Like they can beat you on a ground game. They can beat you through the air. They can beat you with Milrow's legs. I think, They've shown an ability to do all those things to a certain extent. I don't know if they're very good at any of those. They're just good enough where in each game, you know, they've done it to kind of win different ways, but um, they're just, they're just kind of there in, in certain ways with the <laughs> offense. It's just like, you don't really know exactly what they are still. And this is halfway through the year. Like they could come out against Arkansas and run 50 times and run for 300 yards and be like, all right, <laughs> We would know less at that point. Week. Right. I just don't know what to say about this offense. It's uh, it's a different story every week. Oh, which is part of the fun. Um, last last buy or sell from me. Um, it actually is from me. This is something I wanted to pose to you just to kind of see what you thought. Um, I feel like I know what you're going to say, but I'm going to give my spiel anyway. I'd like to suggest that Alabama's offensive line is playing a little bit better. Um, we know the numbers, the tide have allowed 26 sacks this season per, per pro football focus, um, as well as, well, that's not per PFF. They've allowed a hundred pressures through six games per PFF. That is staggering. Um, 26 sacks, only two schools in the country have allowed more sacks than Alabama. That's Colorado with 31 and old dominion with 32. Um, again, numbers, not great. Um, through the first six weeks of the season though, and this is per PFF's tracking data, the offensive line has only been credited with giving up seven of the 26 sacks, and they've only been credited with giving up 42 of the 100 pressures. Break the first half of the season up into quarters. The first three games they allowed, I believe it was five sacks, 28 pressures. Um, the last three games, two sacks, 16 pressures. And when you combine the fact that the last three games, they have played better competition, right? A&M ranks first nationally in sacks. Ole Miss is in the top 25. Um, Mississippi State, I believe, is tied for 28th or something like that. Um, and then their first three games, like Middle Tennessee and Texas, are both outside the top 40. I believe South Florida might be inside the top 30, but not a lot. I would suggest that in pass protection, not run blocking, they're still not very good at that, but pass protection, Alabama's offensive line is playing a little bit better. Are you buying or selling? Well, I guess – the thing that comes to mind is you hear, was it a hundred pressures they've allowed? It's not good. <clears throat> but then the offensive lines only allowed less than half of that. Is that what yeah. I heard? So who, who the heck has allowed the rest of them? I mean, it's been the tight ends or the running backs, or are they making a judgment call that there's a free blitzer and Milrow should have adjusted <laughs> something? That's not to like dump on PFF, but I think sometimes it's really hard, even watching like all 22 footage to know exactly what the protection call was. Who was supposed to do what? Did the quarterback not change something at the line? Did an offensive lineman not make the right call to somebody next to him? 
um, if you do have like a free rusher or something like that. So there's a degree of subjectivity, I think, involved there. Um, and you can blame Tommy Reese. You can blame Milrow. You can blame the O-line. You can blame a running back. I, sometimes there are like obvious situations where the running back steps up and needs to block somebody and he doesn't. Sometimes it's just not that obvious because – the line might have been doing exactly what they were told to do, but it's not the right thing for that defense. So um, it's hard to kind of split the hair and say a sack was the quarterback's fault or a sack was the offensive line's fault. Like sometimes it's kind of mixed in there. Um, so am I buying or selling the line? Yeah, I think I'm buying to some degree. I think Mississippi State game was certainly better. Um, you know, the A&M game was such a mixed bag um to still give up five sacks they were not able to run the ball at all um and i think the best part about that line in the AM game was they were able to block on those big passes because if they don't do that then they're probably not winning that game so they executed those when they needed to you had eight pre-snap penalties from the offensive line one from burton so nine false starts total not great um no. so Better, yeah, like they're better than they were in South Florida. Um, they're better than they were in the first half of the Ole Miss game, but it's kind of you're crawling your way out of the basement. Like they're still um, not a very good line, quite frankly. Yeah, no, I think they, they, they're not playing great. Like they're not making people quit, to use their words. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think when it comes to pass protection, I, they just they look like they've been playing a little bit better. The numbers back it up a little bit. To your point on, you know, who else has given up these pressures, like I think the just best of my understanding, like, you know, pressures can be allowed, but they can also be earned. Um, you know, like Texas A&M did a lot of blitzing, right? So they're sending six. Alabama's only got five in protection. Like as long as those five do their jobs, it's not technically a loss. If that makes sense, right? So A and M blitzed on get the number here sixty four percent of Milrow's dropbacks, which resulted in twelve pressures and five of the six sacks. Um, so I believe the other one was a, when you know when he was spied on that very first one. Um, you know, whereas that's totally different from say week two, right, where Texas won. Um, you know, they had five sacks, twenty five pressures, and they only blitzed on like thirty six percent of Milrose dropbacks, you know, they were just winning, you know, four on five and, you know, the offensive line was just getting torched that entire game. So there's that element to it. There's also, you know, are they, are they playing better because Tommy Reese is keeping tight ends back to help protect? Yes. I think that's part of it too. The running backs, you know, especially over the last three games, but really ever since the first game and even against Texas, I would argue they're doing a little bit better in pass protection. So it's, it's a collective group effort. Right. And, you know, I think a lot of these sacks the last few weeks, Milrow has stepped into them and it's like, bro, don't do that. You know, like you could really help your numbers here if you just like got rid of the ball or just tucked and ran the ball, um, you know, but he wants to be a pass first guy. So there's a lot that goes into it. Like, obviously like them improving, you know, even slightly doesn't excuse all the penalties. It doesn't excuse the, the piss poor run blocking, um, you know, of the penalties, here's another note, like six touchdowns called back on penalties this season. Three of them have been on the offensive line, right? Like Caden Proctor against both South Florida and Texas. And then Darian Dalcourt had the illegal man downfield against Texas. So um, that's not great. Um, but it seems like there's a little bit of improvement here. And you wonder if that means that they can improve in other areas too. I would chalk up a lot of the false starts to the fact that they were playing at Kyle Field. Um you know, the rest of their big games, I know they have to go to Auburn, um, but the rest of their bigger games are going to be at Brian Denny. I'd like to think that that would help. Um, I guess we'll see. But, you know, there's the maybe I'm taking the most optimistic view here, but I think there's reason to believe that maybe they can figure it out enough to not be a liability by the end of the year. Not a strength, but not a liability. Yeah. And it's funny, too, because 2021, um, that offensive line was not good. And they gave up a ton of sacks. I think it was 37 that year total. <clears throat> they had an absolutely horrific game at, at Auburn. Um, I mean, just a terrible game at Auburn. And then figured it out at the very end of that game, you know, the last drive and overtime. And then everybody thought that offensive line was going to get manhandled by Georgia the next week in Atlanta with Jordan Davis and Jalen Carter and all those guys. And I guess Georgia might have – chalked it up to like them being sick or having the flu or whatever. But um, that offensive line had a great game against Georgia. It was just completely out of the blue. 
Um, and then, you know, two games later, they did not play well against Georgia in the national championship game. So there's optimism that it might kind of be good enough to get them that far. Um, but you never really know. And that's, again, that's kind of the fun part about this Alabama team is you don't know week to week. And that's different. Um, it's not just the same thing every week. That is, uh, that's very true. I, it's, I, I kind of halfway expected to come down here and cover a dominant Alabama team. Haven't exactly gotten that six weeks in, but like you said, like it's, it's entertaining. And, you know, as somebody who just wants to watch entertaining games each Saturday, I don't know that I can really complain about what we've been able to see so far. So, um, it's been fun, um, at the very least, um, today was fun. This was a fun show. I appreciate you joining me, Mike. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks for having me. Alabama plays Arkansas at 11 a.m. on Saturday. First 11 a.m. kickoff for the Tides since December 2020 uh, when it had a morning start at Arkansas in a game that was rescheduled, I believe, because of COVID-19. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, that'll be a Brian Denny Stadium homecoming weekend for Alabama. We'll be back after that game to recap it. Um, in the meantime, be sure to rate and review the show wherever you listen to your podcasts, Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, even our Bama 247 YouTube page. Subscribe to Bama 247 and 247 Sports. Guys, you can get a subscription for a dollar a month to start and then just $10 a month thereafter for the best coverage of your favorite team. Take advantage of that, especially if you're an Alabama fan. Thank you so much again for listening, you guys. We will talk again soon.